Thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, invitation to take part in the panel discussion. As my introduction, I would uh, like to offer four remarks, all four of them uh, related to terms used in our theme, and all four of them serving as reminders that one could easily misunderstand these notions. I begin with the term from a Christian perspective, which could be misunderstood uh, in several ways, at least from the South African perspective from where I speak. Given our experiences, it would be a misunderstanding to presuppose that a Christian perspective on the common good will necessarily be different from and even opposed to the perspectives of other religious communities and traditions. In our case, both during the long years of struggle against apartheid and since then during the recent decades of social transformation, differences between the religious communities have never played any meaningful role. In the South African society, as radically divided and conflicted as it was, and in deeply disturbing ways still remains, has never suffered from religious tensions and conflicts. On the contrary, adherents of diverse religious traditions were together in the struggle, shoulder to shoulder, sharing the same commitments and values, and today members of different religious communities still cooperate in building a new South Africa without any real awareness of religious tension between them. But furthermore, the expression from a Christian perspective could also cause misunderstanding if it would even seem to suggest that there is something like a Christian perspective in the singular. If anything, we have learned in very painful and humbling ways that there are many perspectives, all claiming to be Christian. And when one speaks about the public responsibilities of churches and Christians, uh, these internal differences very easily harden into tragic and destructive divisions. We are deeply aware that the Christian tradition is indeed an ongoing argument about the very goods that constitute the tradition. And the Reformed tradition, to which I belong, may be even more painfully aware than other, several other Christian traditions of this, since we lack, as Reformed people, all structures of authority that could help us speak with any finality or forbindlichkeit about these challenges. Our story is always a story of many stories, and our perspective one of many competing perspectives. No one can speak on behalf of a Christian perspective in the singular. So pluralism is not outside the Christian perspective something in which we find ourselves. It is integral to the Christian perspective. In fact, vice versa, in our history and experience, the Christian perspective was integral to pluralism and in deeply problematic and troubling ways. People in South Africa were used to call the church a site of struggle, and they called the Bible a site of struggle. What is more, our rich and complex Christian perspectives on public life are deeply historical. They change over time. They do not remain the same. During the time of transition in South Africa, Wolfgang Huber, then Bishop of the uh, EKD in Berlin, Brandenburg, gave some talks in South Africa on the ways in which context change and how churches then respond by reading the signs of the times and thereby finding and defining their public roles under continuously changing circumstances in new ways. Several influential church leaders and theologians, figures in South Africa, took those speeches very seriously. Russell Botman, a well-known South African theologian, took that as the inspiration for his doctoral dissertation. One can even, in our case, describe successive stages, historical phases, during which theologians in South Africa used expressions like black theology, then contextual theology, then kairos theology, then prophetic theology, one after the other in their attempts to describe 
what they felt called doing in their changing circumstances. So taken together, this underlines how deeply aware our South African experiences made us that there is no single a historical, a contextual Christian perspective on serving the common good. There are only contextual perspectives, and they too are ever changing. Looking back on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Emeritus Archbishop Desmond Tutu described how he became increasingly aware during his lifetime of how much theology, faith, religion, matters to public life. Many of us there share this conviction, which is perhaps the reason why many South Africans are so interested in public theology. After all, one could argue that public theology is based on the twofold assumption that public life matters and that faith matters for public life. There is, however, no simple and single Christian perspective on how the faith matters for public life, and expecting that would be a grave misunderstanding. Secondly, from the perspective of our painful South African experiences, the expression pluralistic may also be misunderstood. It may easily suggest something far too innocent and harmless. In our own history, we knew expressions like apartheid, literally being separate, and later separate development to describe our realities. Both of these, and in fact many other expressions used also over decades, including pluralism, and diversity, and ethnic diversity, and race, they all masked the complexities which we were facing and which we still find difficult to name and to address today. Our society was and remains not merely pluralistic and different, but deeply unequal, unfair and unjust, oppressive and exclusive in myriads of complex ways. We suffer from histories of inequalities. It is no wonder that students on our campuses today prefer terms like decolonization and often express and discuss this in sophisticated yet also deeply frustrated and angry ways. Our pluralism is structured by power and structures of power, by privilege and historical injustices by complex intersections of culture, race, and identity constructions that all of them include and exclude. The term pluralistic may simply be too innocent to remind us of all these tensions. It may suggest that we are equal in all respects, only different, but that would be far from the truth. These realities make the use of every single category, slogan or motto or moral ideal, whatever, problematic, as Richard Sennett reminded us in his moving study on respect in a world of inequality. Respect is a fine-sounding moral category, but in a world of inequality, respect can become deeply problematic. So what could be a Christian perspective in such a contested world of inequalities. In our reform tradition, during apartheid, the church confessed its own sense of calling by naming three challenges. The need for unity, reconciliation, and justice, and importantly, for these three together. Unity refers to the conviction that we somehow all belong together in the body of Christ, but also as human beings and in the household of faith. Different Christian traditions appeal to different resources from scripture and tradition to argue for unity and belonging. John Calvin, for example, argued for the dignity of all human beings by appealing to what he called the twofold mirror 
which we see in all others, irrespective of who they are, namely both the image of God and our own flesh. And that makes us one with everyone. Any Christian perspective is supposed to appreciate that we are one on a much deeper level than anything that makes us different from one another, that distinguishes and divides and separates us, and that we should find ways of embodying this unity and belonging to one another also in our common life together in the polis. Reconciliation refers to the conviction that unity is not enough. Since there is brokenness in us and between us, we share histories of division and conflict and therefore pain and bitterness. We carry memories of anger and fear and we know feelings of resentment and distrust and alienation. Even unity will remain superficial if we do not find ways of dealing also with these histories and these memories of brokenness and bitterness. And the Christian perspective is supposed to be that we have already been reconciled with God in Christ and therefore with one another, and that this is in fact the ministry of reconciliation entrusted to the church to proclaim and to embody. In our Reformed tradition, part of our internal struggles in South Africa was precisely about the question whether the reconciliation in Christ is able to overcome the many forms of difference and brokenness between human beings and groups of human beings. Therefore, the dominant ideology at that, that, that time in our country that, uh, that borders bring peace and that uh, building walls create good neighbors, that dominant ideology was called, was declared to be uh, false teaching in the light of the gospel of reconciliation. Justice refers to the conviction that unity and reconciliation, including forgiveness and embrace, will remain superficial and will remain under continuous threat if the continuing legacies of inequality and injustice and oppression from the past were not somehow addressed as well. We inherited structures systems and situations created by colonialism, slavery, racism, domination and exploitation. It would be unjust simply to continue into the future as if this past does not still impact on our present. From our Christian perspective, we were convinced that the God revealed in Jesus Christ is the help of the helpless the one who cares for those in need, a God who is in a special way, the God of the destitute, the poor, the wronged, the suffering, the downtrodden, the oppressed, and that as church, we are also called to follow and practice such compassionate justice. So, at least from our particular South African Christian perspective, the notion pluralistic may easily be understood in ways too harmless and innocent to remind us of all these aspects of our common life. It may point to our differences without reminding us of our belonging together, of the brokenness of our common histories, and of the inequalities and injustices still dividing us. Thirdly, the reference to the contributions of religions I found interesting and also uh, something that could easily be misunderstood. Particularly from my own reformed perspective, we may easily hear this as the question about what we should say about the common good in a pluralist society. What our views are. What we have to contribute to the public opinion as if our only contribution lies in what we have to say. Now speaking is at the heart of the Protestant perspective. After all, that is why we confessed in apartheid South Africa. Confession is for us an important contribution to public life. We are convinced that what we say matters. From our perspective, confession is important for at least three reasons. It is saying yes 
affirming what we are committed to, what we believe in, and what we find important. It is saying no, denying what we regard as false, and exposing and rejecting what we want to resist in the light of the yes. And it is saying that we feel implicated in what went wrong. We are sorry. We do not fully see, we do not really understand, we have not listened properly, we did not care enough, we are also part of the problem, not the solution. All three of these forms of confessional discourse are important for public life from our perspective. Saying yes, saying no, saying we feel co-responsible. Yet confession is not the only form of Christian speaking. There are several other ways as well, which other Christian traditions may perhaps emphasize more and better. In pluralistic societies in particular, it is therefore necessary that Christians will learn to speak, in the words of the ecumenical theologian Keith Clements, which may involve unlearning ways in which we have been accustomed before to speak, and, and learning to speak more modestly, humbly, even anonymously, in languages not always recognizable as Christian, about the things we believe in, the ways we want to say yes and no. It is no wonder that these questions, how faith traditions may become bilingual and even multilingual, are important for public theologians today, including questions about the ability to translate the thick languages of worship and faith into the moral language of secular and pluralist societies. Uh, Bishop Bedford Strom has done uh, lots of wonderful work on, 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 on these questions. But still, speaking is not the only contribution that religious communities, traditions, and adherents make to the common good in pluralistic societies. And it may not even be the most important contribution at all. From our perspective, we realize that it is also important to learn how to see differently, how to think differently, how to become sensitive, how to care, how to be present, how to act, how to get involved, and of particular interest to our Reformed perspective, how not to commit the so-called sins of omission through our apathy. Perhaps the major contributions to the common good in pluralistic societies, in these uh, many other daily forms of being human, of just living together, uh, that may often remain unseen and unreflected for some of us. And finally, from a South African perspective, the notion of the common good itself may be ambiguous and problematic particularly when it is used together with societies in the plural. From an African perspective, of course, the reality of societies in the plural is intimately linked to the history and legacy of colonialism and the arbitrary division of our continent. Many of our contemporary problems still have to do with these still existing divisions. The notion of societies in the plural with all their connotations of sovereignty and being nation states with the powers, their powers of defining insiders and outsiders, dividing between us and them, calling some citizens and calling other aliens and migrants and refugees, distinguishing between those welcome and those not welcome. All of this has become deeply problematic and contested. From at least some Christian perspectives, it may be more faithful to our tradition to see the challenges differently and to think in terms of flourishing and fullness of life in our shared common world rather than in terms of societies in the plural and their self-perceived common good and their own best interests making themselves great, protecting themselves, as controversial as such a claim may sound today. In this spirit, South African Reformed Christians at Kitwe in Zambia, concerned about global economic exclusion and ecological destruction, 
once called on the global community of faith to consider whether these growing realities do not challenge our faith itself. This cry joined a worldwide movement and eventually in Accra, in Ghana, the world community of Reformed churches declared that our faith is indeed at stake in how we respond to these challenges, not only of our pluralistic societies, but indeed of our global pluralistic yet excluding and including world. After Accra, some German churches and some South African churches together studied the implications of these convictions and published a document on dreaming a different world together. From our perspective, indeed, the questions about common well-being and flourishing in a different kind of world are even more difficult but also more fundamental than merely thinking about the common good of our sovereign nation states and pluralistic societies. Or rather, it is precisely the same question, but framed differently. Perhaps we could add to the in in our theme also a between and speak about the common good between pluralistic societies. Although our perspectives are all inevitably contextual and historical, the way I began, it is only together that we can responsibly address them. And therefore, it is such a wonderful opportunity and privilege to participate in this consultation uh, and also in this panel. Thank you.